report from NBC News about some of the 65 hours of closed door testimony given to the House impeachment committees by Trump administration officials. NBC News reports at least three current and former U.S. officials have all made the same startling admission. A coveted White House visit for the new Ukrainian leader had been explicitly conditioned on his agreeing to investigations that could have helped President Trump's re-election. And when U.S. Ambassador to the EU, Gordon Sondland, was asked point blank under oath whether that constituted a quid pro quo, he did not dispute it, people with knowledge of his testimony said. NBC News reports that thanks to testimony like this and thanks to public comments from Trump, his aides, and his allies, quote, a portrait is emerging of a quid pro quo that evolved over time, with the president progressively upping the ante when his demands were not met. This development comes on the heels of a double victory in court for House Democrats. The chief judge for the D.C. District Court has ruled that the Justice Department must hand over grand jury evidence from special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation to the House Judiciary Committee by October 30th. Politico calls the decision a, quote, groundbreaking victory for Democrats in their effort to investigate whether President Donald Trump should be impeached for obstructing the long-running Russia probe. Grand jury information is typically kept a secret, but Judge Beryl Howard said in her opinion that the disclosures are in, quote, the public's interest in a diligent and thorough investigation into and in a final determination about potentially impeachable conduct by the president described in the Mueller report. The need for the material to be kept secret is minimal and thus easily outweighed by the compelling need for the material. That's one of the victories from this court ruling. The second, Judge Howell dismissed claims from the White House and congressional Republicans that the impeachment inquiry is illegitimate because it has not been authorized in a formal House vote. Judge Howell wrote, even in cases of presidential impeachment, a House resolution has never, in fact, been required to begin an impeachment inquiry. Republicans had claimed that the House Judiciary Committee cannot begin impeachment proceedings without a formal vote of the House, and that even if it could, Speaker Nancy Pelosi is not empowered to simply grant that authority to the Judiciary Committee. But Judge Howell rejected those arguments, writing, these contentions are at worst red herrings and at best, incorrect. Leading off our discussion tonight are Natasha Bertrand, national security correspondent for Politico and an MSNBC contributor, Lisa Graves, former, former staff member of the Senate Judiciary Committee and former Deputy Assistant Attorney General under President Clinton, and Evan McMullen, former CIA operative and a former independent presidential candidate. He is the co-founder of Stand Up Republic. So, Lisa, I do want to start with you. This is a ruling that um, is not going to not going to be, I guess, taken well by House Republicans in the White House. They wanted to say over and over again that this impeachment inquiry was illegal. It was unconstitutional because they never held a vote. Well, those arguments are simply misplaced, and Judge Howell, the chief judge uh, in the District of Columbia, was very clear in her analysis showing why that argument is deeply flawed. And she also talked at length about how this is fully consistent with centuries of legal precedent of judicial decisions in terms of access to material like this, as well as uh, longstanding interpretations of the Constitution and the power of Congress to conduct these investigations without having any of the procedural hurdles that the House has attempted to assert, including uh, statements by the founding fathers, by the framers, about uh, the power of Congress to investigate these matters in a quasi-judicial ma uh, manner. Natasha, the Washington Post reports that Trump and his advisors are now starting to get worried about the impeachment inquiry. They write, after weeks of dismissing the impeachment inquiry as a hollow partisan attack, President Trump and his closest advisors now recognize the snowballing probe poses a serious threat to the president and that they have little power to block it, according to multiple aides and advisors. Walk us through what you've learned so far about the impeachment inquiry and, and why, why it's going to give the president and his, and his advisors, why it is giving them such pause. 
Yeah, well, if you speak to Republicans on the Hill, they would say it's about time the White House started getting serious about this impeachment inquiry. I mean, just the cascade of administration officials that we've seen going to the Hill and defying explicit administration orders not to testify is reason enough for the White House to be very concerned by the precedent that sets. I mean, you have career diplomats at the State Department who, in direct defiance of what state has told them to do, which is not testify, Ha have been testifying for hours on Capitol Hill, sometimes for as many as 12 hours at a time, about all of the things that they saw going on with regard to the Ukraine matter and, of course, potential abuse of power by the president. Now you have Tim Morrison, who, of course, is on the National Security Council, who has said that he will testify if he is subpoenaed. He's a very, very important figure in this because he has the position, of course, that Fiona Hill had. He has responsibility for the Europe portfolio, Ukraine, Russia, and so he was in a position during all all of this craziness with regard to Trump's, you know, pressure on the Ukrainian president to get him to launch investigations into the Bidens and Ukrainian interference in the election in 2016, he had a first, he had a, a, a window into that, a direct window into that, and he was interacting directly with the officials who were involved in this. So he is defying the White House orders not to testify, and you have other White House officials, former and current, who are considering doing the same. So I, I think Republicans now would say, look, the White House really has to start getting serious about this. So with these officials acting in defiance and with the, the continuing release of revelations that are damaging to the president and his no quid pro quo defense, Evan, not only that, but, but the grand jury um, uh, uh, materials that will now be released to Democrats are going to have the wealth of what Robert Mueller was able to dig up. At what point, or do you see a point, I guess, where Republican support starts to crack in a serious way, more so than Mitt Romney saying he's concerned. Well, and I think you look at the Senate and the House differently, of course, because of the political dynamics that are just different for six ter or six year uh, term senators and two year term representatives. As far as representatives are concerned, look, I'm hopeful that there will be a handful, maybe a dozen uh, optimistically Republicans who ultimately in the House vote for impeachment. But I think one thing to understand here, we're, we've all been asking the question for years, when are Republicans going to decide that President Trump is no longer worth supporting? You know, I, I don't think that's the right question anymore. I think really the way we need to see this is that these members, especially of the House, it, it's not like most of them actually love the president. And it's not like they're actually trying to protect the president per se. It's, it's more that they're trying to protect themselves. They mm -hmm. understand that their power, that their seats, that their survival in, in primary contests in their districts in, in years ahead, not only you know in 2020, but beyond that, they understand their prospects of, uh, which are probably overly optimistic for this cycle, winning back the House, all have everything to do with whether the president uh, implodes, whether his presidency implodes, or whether he somehow survives this uh, politically. I'm not, not even talking about conviction and removal in the Senate, but it's about them protecting their own power. And for that reason, the president's going to be able to continue to do a lot of terrible things. As long as he can keep his base with them, he'll keep most of them, I'm sad to say, well, in line too. I guess that's the better question. At what point do Republican voters, not even Republican voters, Trump voters start to say, you know what? I'm a little tired of this, or this makes me uncomfortable. I wonder if there's a point and if this is what might change their mind. Uh, I, I'm curious, though, about something we learned uh, from Ambassador, from diplomat uh, Bill Taylor, and, and I'm curious about what we might learn more uh, about it. Um, he talks about, Lisa, being on a conference call, a video conference call while he's still in Ukraine, and there's somebody from OMB in the room. They're off camera, and they say, we were told not to release the funds. The president told the chief of staff who told OMB. That seems to be a pretty direct link to the president of the United States. That certainly does uh, seem like a very direct link, and it also is a sign of video um, evidence as well as potential audio evidence, and we know that there was an attempt by this White House to move material into uh, more secretive files to try to prevent it from being disclosed. It's sort of different from the Nixon uh, missing, uh, missing time on the tapes. Here you have video and potentially audio as well as documentary notes of conversations with the president that really should be made available to Congress in its investigation. And, and Natalie, uh, the John Bolton, 
John Bolton um, testifying potentially. His lawyers are in contact with the uh, House committees. Um, what do you think, Natasha, sorry, not Natalie, what do you think John Bolton uh, might be able, it's 10 o'clock on a Friday and I've got a sick baby at home, so you're going to have to forgive me. Um, no explanation needed. What do you think of John Bolton um, potentially testifying in front of House committees and, and, and what could that do to the president's defenses? Yeah, it's a huge escalation if it does happen because, of course, John Bolton did not leave on the best terms and he has not been shy about speaking out against the president and his policies um, in recent months since he was kind of unceremoniously fired or resigned. I guess it depends on who you ask. But there's a new wrinkle in this, and this is just being reported uh, as of a few minutes ago by the New York Times, which is that Bolton's deputy has now filed a lawsuit um, trying to compel a court to tell him who he has to listen to, the White House or Congress. Does he have to listen to Congress when they subpoena him for testimony, or does he have to listen to the White House when they tell him that he can't testify? The decision that the court hands down, obviously, will have wide-ranging implications for the other officials who the White House tells not to testify and who Congress wants to hear from in the impeachment inquiry. So Charles Kupperman, that's the deputy who filed this lawsuit, he could really be setting a, a precedent here that the Democrats might not be happy with in the end. And then I guess, how does Rudy Giuliani factor into this? Lisa, will, will you expect to see House Democrats demand to hear from Rudy Giuliani? I know he's defied us or is trying to defy a subpoena. Is his voice necessary to this investigation? Well, I think it is in part because of the role that he's been playing roving around the world, basically advancing these threats on behalf of the president and also coordinating with the attorney general, it appears. And so you have a situation in which it's not just the campaign or the president's personal lawyer in Giuliani, but also uh, also Attorney General Barr and Pompeo as well, who have been uh, put in service of this agenda. Um, so I think there are a number of officials in the government as well as uh, people that uh, Trump has uh, assigned as his agents to pursue this quid pro quo who need to appear before Congress and they fail to do so at their peril. And Lisa, let me lean on your expertise for one more question. Will the Mueller decision, the grand jury decision, hold up on appeal? I think it will. Um, judge Howell is a very careful judge. It's a very well-reasoned opinion. It cites uh, ample precedent. It's, I think, very solidly grounded. We'll see if these um, Trump judges uh, actually follow the law or whether they're going to uh, try to tilt the courts in his favor. But on the merits, that decision should be upheld and upheld uh, all the way up. I know we're kind of digging back when it comes to the Mueller investigation, and, and we're, we've moved on to an entirely different uh, controversy, but digging back and thinking about what we were waiting to learn in the Mueller investigation, what will you be looking out for in particular, Evan, on, on what we might see in those grand jury documents? Well, you know, as far as the Mueller investigation is, is concerned, what I still really am waiting to see, which uh, will not necessarily come out in these uh, grand jury uh, additional pieces of information, but are the, the CI elements of, of the investigation. I believe there was still a lot left out of that report, including uh, a lot about Michael Cohen and his travels and contacts, and, and there are other pieces of the investigation that for some reason uh, we're not in the final report. Um, so I don't know if through this additional now uh, exposure of that investigation in Congress, if they'll dig up more information on the CI side of things. Certainly obstruction will be a part of it now that uh, now that, that information is more, what comes from the grand jury is more directly related to that. But the important thing I think here is that you know, the, the Mueller investigation and the Russia issue set the stage for what we are now very much focused on, which is the Ukraine scandal. I don't think we would be as concerned as a country about the Ukraine scandal, to be honest, if we hadn't gone through the Russia scandal first. But because we have the Russia, scan Russia scandal and then the Ukraine scandal, it sets a, we see a pattern in the president's abuse of power in his attacks with foreign powers against our democracy. And so I think what's interesting about this is that yes, Congress is focused on the Ukraine scandal now, but now we're going to circle back and now the Russia scandal is going to become, I think, a part of, of this impeachment inquiry. Again, obviously it will be, but I think it's going to become now more a part of the American 
the American sort of consideration, the people's consideration of whether the president should be impeached again. It's just interesting how those, how the, the Russia scandal set the stage for the Ukraine scandal, and now the Ukraine scandal is in a way bringing the Russia scandal back into consideration, back into the situation. Yeah, and I remember two years of the, of the Russia investigation, and the and the big overarching theme was don't ask a foreign government to interfere, to meddle, to attack our elections. The very next day, Donald Trump has a phone call with President Zelensky of Ukraine after after the investigation is over, after Robert Mueller testifies. The very next day, he calls President Zelensky of Ukraine and says, do me a favor, though, investigate the DNC server and Joe Biden. Natasha Bertrand, Lisa Graves, Evan McMullen, thank you guys very much. And thank coming you. up, Rudy Giuliani is not the